This video is sponsored by Manscaped. Roddy, you know, like I said, when I first got here, man, Roddy helped me out tremendously, um, gave me the blueprint to being a great receiver. Yo, right off the bat, Roddy White is one of the greatest Atlanta Falcons of all time. But as we all know, the path to greatness is pretty much never linear. Roddy White's career went through three major phases, each requiring a different set of skills, you know? Dude's first couple of years in the league, he was seen as a bust. Then, out of absolutely nowhere, Roddy's career soared to new heights. But while he was still airborne, in flies another Falcon whose greatness eclipsed even that of Roddy's. So now the former bust turned superstar has to pivot again and become a mentor and honestly he became a pretty damn good one it's hard to find anybody with a bad word to say about roddy white the only way you can get open is if they hide it other than richard sherman it's hard to find anybody with a bad word to say about roddy white an unforgotten legend and today it's time to tell the story this is what happened to rowdy roddy white kill the wayne yeah well, I'm no Okay, real quick before we jump into today's video, I gotta give a quick shout out to today's video sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below the waist hygiene. So look out for both yourself and your significant other by keeping everything clean and hygienic. The Manscaped engineering team spent over 18 months perfecting this right here, the Lawnmower 3.0. And check it out, bro. I've been using one of these now for the last couple of months, and I can go ahead and say this is probably the greatest ball trimmer ever created. Long gone are those college days where I try to freshen up real quick before going out with the fellas. We go hit the club. I'm dancing with a nice young lady. But due to chafing, burns, nicks, scratches, etc. You know, the situation of me dancing with her is not nearly as enjoyable as it should be. And that sucks, bro. But thanks to this third generation trimmer, manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past. I'm telling you, this right here, this is a premium piece of equipment. We talking cutting edge ceramic blade, LED light for precision, and I could shoot this B-roll all day because it got 90 minute battery life. Now check it out, if you purchase the new Perfect Package 3.0 kit, what that's gonna do for you is get you the most bang for your buck. We're talking 20% savings on your order instantly. A new replacement blade delivered to your crib every three months. And for a limited time, subscribers get not one, but two free gifts. First off, you're gonna get the shared travel bag. That's a $40 value. And you're gonna get a pair of the patented high-performance anti-chafing Manscaped boxer briefs. So click the link in the description and get 20% off plus free delivery on your Perfect Package 3.0 when you use the code FLIMLO20 at manscaped.com. Again, 20% off free delivery. Manscaped.com, use the code FLIMLO20. Yo, shout out to Manscaped once again for sponsoring the video. Let's get it. Gerard Lamar White was born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. Growing up, he was a huge fan of pro wrestling and eventually kinda commandeered the name of Rowdy Roddy Piper a former wrestler who once body slammed Mr. T in a boxing match at WrestleMania 2. Now, I don't know if y'all enjoy the random facts I put in these videos or just put up with them, but you know, there you go. Sherrod became Roddy through the routing in front of it and boom, you got yourself a nickname. Like most of us, Roddy dreamed of playing in the NFL once he was older, but dude almost had his dream completely crushed when he was only about eight years old. Dude was so small, the recreation department didn't even want to let him play out of fear that he might get hurt. When you're too small to even play rec ball, like, that's crazy. But Roddy's mom fought back on that decision and eventually the league relented. Regardless, the coach still never put Roddy into the game. He felt it was too small, never really gave the dude a chance. But Roddy's mom really wasn't trying to have it. She knew the rules, it's rec ball, everybody play, okay? So eventually she ran up on a coach, let him know that she was aware of that piece of information. He decided to go ahead, throw Roddy back there on a kick return. First time, as fate would have it, ball goes directly to Roddy. He takes it to the crib, a star is born. Okay, not exactly, it's a few more twists and turns than that. So, Roddy didn't grow up in a great financial situation. His mom worked extremely hard doing multiple jobs, but still, more often than not, a lot of bills would have to go unpaid. 
Watching his mom deal with that really created that drive and ambition in Roddy and he actually had an amazing quote on Takeo Spike's podcast. He said, nothing can simulate desperation. And I just sit back and was like, you know what? He is absolutely right. He's absolutely right. Nothing can replace that. Now, when Roddy hit high school, he had pretty much given up on playing professional football. Maybe the rec league was right and dude was too small. After all, as a sophomore, 6'1", 200 plus pound Roddy White that you know was 5'4", 130 pounds in a 10th grade, bro. So he decided to pick up a different sport. He'd always admired the Ric Flairs and the Roddy Roddy Pipers when he was growing up. He took up wrestling. Now, of course, we all know amateur wrestling is a lot different than professional wrestling. And while at first thought it may seem like an odd choice for a guy who's too small, beautiful thing about wrestling, weight classes, you know? Dude wasn't just out there either. He was a two-time state champion wrestler. And if not for an unexpected growth spurt, dude would have had a completely different type of high-level athletic career. And honestly, I don't think it's a stretch to say that a cat like Roddy, had he kept with that wrestling, he might be the type of person we see in MMA today. A lot of those cats have wrestling backgrounds, you know. But between his sophomore and junior season, Roddy shot up from 5'4 to 5'10. This may have created weight class issues in wrestling, but on the football field, it was an amazing gift. And despite being somewhat of a late bloomer, Roddy in only a couple of seasons became his high school's all-time leading receiver. That's pretty damn impressive, and colleges felt the same way. Thanks to his unbelievable achievement, Roddy had interest from hella D1s. We talking Clemson, South Carolina, NC State, LSU wanted him bad. But when he struggled to get a high enough mark on the SATs, a lot of those schools eventually moved on. That scholarship wasn't gonna wait forever. Now, Roddy has admitted to kind of just coasting through school and his low GPA was the reason he needed such a high SAT score in the first place. And that alone stopped him from going to one of the LSUs or Clemson. And I think Roddy said himself that he personally wanted to go to NC State. But because he couldn't get a high enough mark on the SAT, he went from having coaches visiting his high school every single day to his high school coach having to reach out to one of his old co-workers or teammates for a favor basically rodney's coach called one of his homeboys at uab he was like hey man if we can get everything situated with this kid's sats i'm really hoping you'll be able to save a scholarship for him now check it out this uab we talking about all right so the coach looked at rodney's film and was like yo forget all that bro i'm about to offer him a scholarship right now I'm just gonna pray he eventually gets SATs together. I wanna sign him immediately. So they signed him and after his eighth attempt, Roddy finally got a high enough mark on the SATs to outweigh his low GPA. And he now had a scholarship to the University of Alabama at Birmingham. <laughs> Roddy really didn't take off instantly, but by year two, Dude was the team's reception leader. By year three, he had more catches, yards, and touchdowns than the second and third wide receivers on the team combined. By Roddy's senior year, he had developed into a complete receiver, using his wrestling background to dominate with physicality and his 4-4 speed to make explosive plays down the field. He dominated his last year and led the nation in receiving yards. He caught 71 passes for 1,452 yards and 14 TDs as a senior. Dude went crazy. Ultimate deep threat. He was the only player in the nation with 60 plus catches who averaged over 20 yards per reception. So a guy that would go on to be what I would consider more of a possession receiver in the NFL was making huge plays in college and averaging 20 yards a damn catch. He also led UAB to the school's first ever bowl game, okay? The 2004 Hawaii Bowl, where they came up short, but Roddy did his thing with six catches for 113 and a touchdown. Roddy's combine measurements really showed how far he had come since the 10th grade. He grew from 5'4", 130 pounds to 6'1", 207. Then using his great core and lower body strength, Dude recorded a 41 inch vertical, a 4'4", 40, and hit 18 reps on a bench press. When you couple all of that with his senior year production, even a guy from a small school like UAB has a shot 
to slide into that first round. And that's exactly what happened when the Falcons took Roddy 27th overall. Some scouts called the pick a minor reach, as Roddy was seen more as a second round project with a lot of upside. Here's what one scout had to say. White has an impressive package of skills, but he has work to do. Whoever drafts him will need to show some patience and allow him to fully develop before expecting big things out of him. If given proper coaching and time, White has a lot of upside at the next level. It's crazy because I usually make fun of these old scout reports in these videos, but I mean, dude was pretty spot on. In each of Roddy's first two seasons, he hovered right around that 30 catch 500 yard mark. To put that in perspective for a first round pick, John Ross did that last year in only eight games. And while I personally don't agree, most people would consider him a bust. So things were no different from Roddy White back when he was drafted. So you ask the question, why was Roddy struggling so bad? Well, OG Michael Vick was his quarterback in Atlanta in 2005. Vic was larger than life, and being an Atlanta Falcon at the time meant the city had a ton of distractions to offer you. Roddy has admitted to getting caught up in pretty much all of them. Two years in, and Roddy White was just an average receiver. But in 2006, when a perfectly thrown touchdown pass slipped straight through his fingertips, the Falcons' playoff hopes slipped right along with it. It was the type of missed opportunity to make you just reevaluate everything that you're doing, and that's what happened with Roddy White. Roddy was pretty quickly headed toward bus status if things didn't change very quickly. He had fallen in love with the lifestyle of being an NFL player in Atlanta. Bro, to put it in layman's, he was pretty much partying and bullshitting his career away. In steps veteran wide receiver Joe Horn, who signed with the Falcons on the tail end of his 11 year career. He couldn't offer the skill set or production an early 2000 version of Joe Horn would have brought to the table but the four-time Pro Bowler has something even more valuable to the Falcons, especially in the long run. A much needed mentor for their trash talking, fast living, first round pick who was spiraling in the wrong direction. It was a perfect fit. Joe took Roddy under his wing and unlocked the potential the Falcons had once seen in dude when they picked him 27th overall. Here's Roddy's take on it. It changed my whole career. I wouldn't be where I am without Joe. I saw his work ethic, how much work he put in during the week just to get ready for the game. So right there, Roddy began partying less and preparing more. Just to sit here for a quick second and put a little bit of emphasis on this, Joe Horn was in Atlanta for one year and made a huge impact. He showed Roddy the way and Roddy became Roddy. Then he took what he learned and paid it forward and you can actually still see the spoils of that in Atlanta today. His third season in the league, Roddy went from a guy who was looking like he may be a bust to a 1,000 yard receiver. So this was Roddy's breakout year, but it was also the year Michael Vick, his quarterback, ended up getting locked up. In steps Matt Ryan, Roddy becomes his favorite receiver. Then Roddy White went on a tear, making four straight Pro Bowls and one first team all pro. That 2010 season was definitely his best. I remember in 2010, dude went crazy against my Bengals. 11 catches for 200 yards and two touchdowns, outshining both T.O. and Ocho in that game. That same year, he made the play that would pretty much immortalize him as an Atlanta Falcon. In a game versus the 49ers, the Falcons trail by one. Matt Ryan's gotta drive them down for the go-ahead score, but he throws a pick to Nate Clements. Game over, right? Nah. Roddy White, a star receiver, hawks down Clements, strips the ball, Falcons recover, and then they drive down and win the game. This is the type of moment that defines who Roddy White is in his career. And he was still showing this type of effort like he was trying to make the team right in the middle of his six straight 1,000 yard seasons. In 2011, the Falcons selected Julio Jones sixth overall. And you saw the clip in the beginning. Julio has said on several occasions that Roddy White really showed him how to be a pro, which is why I thought that whole Joe Horn thing was so important because he showed Roddy how to be a pro. Y'all get it though. And it's crazy looking back because Julio, one of the best receivers in the game today, if not the best, wasn't even a leading receiver on his own team until his fourth year. Roddy was still holding down that honor in year nine of his career. Roddy had become one of the elite receivers in the game peaking at number 39 on the NFL Top 100 chart in 2013, much to the dismay of his hated rival Richard Sherman, who finished number 50 that year. Roddy White, uh, 
Top 100? No. He's just not in my book. He's just not top 100 player. Julio Jones is high on my list because they have to account for him. The touchdown really wasn't wasn't by coverage. He, but that's not here nor there. I'm never going to throw a teammate under the bus, so take what you made from it. They, the only way you can get open is if they hide it. If he has to stand outside like like everybody else does and play the game and, 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 and line up and, bam, go head-to-head -head with me and Brandon Browner, he has a long day. I mean, you can see the plays when he lined up on the edge. There was, I think he caught one pass, a comeback or something. We're in, so. All right, Roddy's caught. He's All right, bro, Richard Sherman is my dude, but these are just some really bad takes and honestly i don't even read into them too deep because they're all pretty easily argued against to be fair this was seven eight years ago and we all know richard sherman's just hyper competitive and we'll say anything he thinks might get under his opponent's skin so so it's definitely nothing wrong with that but i'm gonna have to go ahead and debunk these first off he tried to blame the scheme for roddy's success and sure scheme plays a part with any player's success you don't hear people saying mj was only great because of the triangle offense and because he played in that system he ain't a top player somehow that would be a ridiculous argument right plus is hypocritical because Richard Sherman is pretty well known for being a cover three zone corner himself. Obviously, he doesn't play 100% zone. Of course, at times he plays man coverage and dudes a future Hall of Fame cornerback. He can play man, but his highest levels of success have come while he was playing majority cover three or zone corner and not traveling with the best receivers so it's hypocritical in my opinion to try to call out roddy for anything scheme related then he said it's because julio is on the other side again there's some logic to this roddy has happily admitted that things got a lot easier on him when julio came before julio dude was facing double teams all the time and when julio got there defenses couldn't scheme him as much still julio was drafted in 2011 roddy white had four straight 1000 plus yard seasons before julio ever set foot in the nfl roddy white was literally voted first team all pro the same year julio was voted first team all sec this man led the entire NFL in receptions that year while Julio was still in college. So those comments don't have a whole lot of merit. Lastly, I also felt it was hypocritical. Damn, I feel bad because like Sherman's my dude. But honestly, I felt it was hypocritical to bring up Roddy's teammates at all, given the fact that Richard Sherman played with Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor, two of the best safeties in the NFL during those Legion of Boom days. He definitely benefited from having those guys on his team and there's no shame in that. That's not a diss, that's not a knock, it's just a fact. So my point is, every argument Sherm used against Roddy White can pretty easily be turned against him. But personally, I don't think any of this stuff subtracts from the greatness of either player. These are the circumstances they found themselves in and they made the best of their opportunities. Anyway, that's just how I see it. As Roddy got into the latter stages of his career, Julio Jones inevitably became the team's leading receiver. And fortunately, unlike some other people who are put in the exact same situation, Roddy handled this extremely graciously. He continued to mentor Julio. He understood that they could both coexist and for years they did. Now, there were times where Roddy wasn't happy with his role in the offense as he still felt he could contribute to winning. But all in all, dude really excelled at that mentor role, bro. He did a damn good job. Roddy White still holds the majority of the major receiving records for the Atlanta Falcons franchise. Julio's already snatched a couple and will undoubtedly snatch a few more before he's done. But check out some of the franchise records that Roddy White currently holds. Most receptions in a career. Most career starts for wide receiver. Most games played at wide receiver. Most receiving yards in a half. Most receptions in a playoff game. And most receiving touchdowns in a career. He retired with over 10,000 receiving yards and 63 touchdowns. And the thing that's crazy about Roddy's story, when you think about the fact that he was a late bloomer, like regardless to that, he broke records in high school, college, and in the NFL, and still holds several of them today. That's pretty damn impressive, bro. Since retirement, Roddy's been busy getting inducted into the Falcons Ring of Honor and running the CBD company to help manage pain, stress, anxiety, etc. Dude seems to be handling retirement pretty well. He's been pushing the importance of local voting on his Twitter page and spending time raising his five little ones. This was what happened to Roddy White. I hope y'all enjoyed the video. My name is Flim Low Raps. I'll holler at you next time, though. Yeah.
I'ma go, I'ma go, I'ma go again